I called the pre-arrest briefing for the early hours of the 7th of May. I had previously discussed it with John Du Rose when we had agreed on a strategy which was devised primarily to protect the witnesses in the case of a last-minute purge by the firm. I needed more men and now I telephoned the detective inspectors in each of the ten branches of the regional crime squads around London, asking them to arrange for their men to be available at short notice. The DIs, in their turn, were to telephone me at midnight. When they did I put them off until 3.30 a.m. I was simply not prepared to risk any sort of leak. And when they called back I told them to report with their squads at Tintagel House at 4.30 a.m. For once I followed Tommy Butler's line and did not say why they were wanted. When they arrived the instructions were simple. At 6 a.m. sharp each team was to enter premises and arrest the occupants, tell them briefly the reason, and to make a thorough search. When they left, an officer was to remain on the premises to ensure there could be no communication with any members of the firm who had temporarily avoided capture. All those arrested were to be brought to West End Central Police Station where I had arranged for a number of cells to be made available. Some of the squads were issued with firearms, and with photographs of all suspects, watches were synchronized and the teams were sent away to get into position. Kata and I had reserved the twins for ourselves. Naturally, we had had them under surveillance for the past 24 hours. The craze had been in the Astor Club that night. They had taken Kaufman out on the town, starting with a party in the Old Horns public house before moving up west. They left in the early hours of the morning and went back to their mother's council flat on the ninth floor of Braithwaite House, Shoreditch. At five to six we took the lift to the ninth floor and crowded round the front door listening for any sign of movement. Suddenly we heard the lift start again and then with a great plank the doors opened and a milkman appeared carrying crates. Two of my men grabbed him and before he knew what was happening he was on his way to the ground floor again. Sometimes I wonder how many times he has earned the pint with that story. At six o'clock precisely, Algie Hemingway jimmied the front door. Two minders were asleep in the living room, and by the time I followed through both the twins had been handcuffed. Ronnie was found in bed with a young boy and Reggie with a girl. They two were arrested along with the minders. When I told Ronnie he was being arrested he replied, Yes, all right Mr. Reed, but I've got to have my pills you know that. He was referring to his supply of Stematol which kept him on an even mental keel. When Frank Cater told him he could not have them he pleaded with me and asked me to bring a letter from his psychiatrist which said he had to take two a day. Reggie was sanguine about the matter, saying he had had a late night. Back at West End Central, when I told them they would be charged with conspiracy to murder, Ronnie replied, all I can say is it's ridiculous. Murder? I don't know nothing about no murder. Did you remember my pills? I shall have to have them. Reggie said, yes Mr. Reed we've met like this before. We've been expecting another frame up for a long time. But this time we've got witnesses. There's plenty of people will want to help us. Kaufman was arrested in his rooms at the Mayfair Hotel, a stone's throw from the Aston nightclub. He vigorously protested his innocence but, following my instructions, the officers had asked the manager to inform them when a package came for him. Sure enough two days later it arrived and when it was sent to the yard and opened it contained $190,000 of stolen bearer bonds, all daubed with Mr. K's fingerprints. At the other end of the suite was poor old Billy Exley. When I later saw him I reminded him that when I had last seen him he had told me he would get a gun to defend himself against the craze. Now a loaded shotgun had been found at his address. They don't bother me Mr. Reed, he said, not on their own. They know I can take care of myself. But they've been threatening the old woman and the kid. In novels, once the suspects have been arrested, the detective takes his wife or girlfriend out for dinner. There is nothing like that in real life. Back at West End Central the cells were full to overcrowding with people waiting to be interviewed and charged. There wasn't time for a sandwich, let alone breakfast. Now the first person I wanted to see was blonde Carol Skinner whose flat I believed to have been the one in which Jack McKitty had been killed. I sent officers round to Evering Road and she was brought to see me and Frank Cater at West End Central. Whilst I expected a certain amount of initial resistance, I expected that we could eventually persuade her to tell us what had happened at her flat that night. To my amazement she denied all knowledge of the craze and was emphatic that her flat had never been used for any unlawful purpose whatsoever. 
Frank and I spent some time with her explaining we had the craze and the rest of the firm under lock and key, but she never even looked like cracking. After trying everything from threats to promises, we were forced to let her go. It was the old, old story. The craze were not yet locked up securely enough to enable people to talk about them. There was still the fear of what might happen if they walked free. Once she was gone, it was a question of getting down to the problem of interviewing the suspects I thought might be prepared to say something and give them the chance to help me and, of course, themselves. Whilst I could not make any promises, I told them the final arbiter in the matter, the Director of Public Prosecutions, might view their position sympathetically. It was a waste of time, of course. They all saw this as another ploy and one which, at this stage, they could contemptuously ignore. Then there was the sorting out of what charges were to be laid against each individual, most of whom were now calling out, literally, to be allowed to see a solicitor. The easy thing about that was they almost all, at that stage, wanted to see Ralph Yems, an article clerk of Sampson & Co., who had taken over the running of the praise docket from Manny Fried who, although he still worked for the same firm, was now getting too old for the day-to-day -day hassles of criminal law. Then came the task of physically typing the charge sheets. There were no word processors back then and it took 36 hours to do them, at times I thought we were never going to get to the end of it. Indeed it was just before 12.45 a.m. on the 10th of May before we started to have the prisoners charged by the duty inspector, and it was 2 a.m. before the last charges were put to the twins. The charges at that stage were two cases of conspiracy to murder, two of blackmail, six relating to stolen bonds, four of long firm frauds and one of grievous bodily harm. When some time later Peter Brody was shown the full list of prisoners, including the additional charges I had brought, he almost clapped his hands and jumped in glee. I'll have this blown up and I'll have it put in the Black Museum, he said. But he never did. The only relics of the case in that museum at Scotland Yard are a large print of the David Bailey photograph of the three Cray brothers, and the LV suitcase. By this time I had been continuously on the go since the 7th of May. Frank Cater and I had been watching over Cooper in the nursing home for two days, and when Kaufman had left I had decided to call the conference to decide on the plan of action. When it had been agreed that we would go I had drawn up the plans for the arrest and briefed the troops for the 6 a.m. raids. I was beginning to feel as though I would never get to bed. I had been sleeping on a makeshift sofa at Tintagel House for some weeks, but there was still a first appearance in court to be got through, let alone dealing with an excited press corps who were not only wanting details of what had happened but were speculating on future developments. The praise were news. Again, in those days, there was no Crown Prosecution Service in London to whom to pass the papers and who would take over the case. On the first appearance the officer in the case had to be there to fend for himself as he asked for an adjournment, outlined the facts of the case and indicated his objections to bail. He would then have to withstand a fair battering from counsel and solicitors for the defense. It would only be later that a file would be sent to the Metropolitan Police Solicitors Department of War, as in this case, the Director of Public Prosecutions himself. I had arranged for considerable security precautions in the number one court at Bow Street where the 18 defendants appeared before Kenneth Barraclough, one then one of the resident stipendiary magistrates. Neither the twins nor Charles Cray, who were represented once again by Ivan Lawrence, opposed the remand in custody, contenting themselves with letting it be known that they were innocent of all charges and would, in due course, be able to prove their innocence, but Richard Dukin appeared on behalf of Kaufman to ask for bail which, along with an application by Gordon Anderson, accused of conspiracy to defraud, was refused. It shows how money has changed in value. Kaufman was said to be a substantial businessman, earning 820000 a year. Nine of the defendants, including Billy Exey, were given bail to reappear on the 31st of May. Although I told Mr. Barraclough that I had no idea when I would be in a position to proceed, as a matter of urgency I was preparing a report for the Director of Public Prosecutions. Bail may have been more difficult to obtain in the 1960s than it is today, but the other side of the coin was that the seemingly endless series of remands which occur nowadays would not be tolerated. Mr. Barraclough said he expected committal proceedings to begin in not much more than a month. In some ways, the real work was just starting, with such a short time in which to compile the mass of evidence and for the papers to be sent to the DPP to prepare the committal papers. The first consideration was the protection of witnesses. Several members of the firm had by being out of their ground at the time, avoided the sweep. It was possible they, and others, might be able to explain to potential witnesses the folly of going ahead and helping the wicked police by giving evidence and so, once again, 
sabotage the empire. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Crazy Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 crazy and other celebrated gangster videos available to view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.